Hello, everyone. Welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Stephanie Valdez, and I'm the co-owner of the bookstore. Tonight, several members of Writers Against Trump join us to discuss the difficult social and political reality we find ourselves in. Speaking of which, while the pandemic has taken a toll on every facet of our lives, virtual programs like the one you're about to see have become a bright spot for the book industry. Thank you to all of our guests tonight and to you for your time and attention. And now for some housekeeping, you should be able to see and hear our presenters, but they cannot see or hear you. If you have a question, please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen to submit it. We'll try to get through as many as we can at the end of the program. You'll also find a chat button at the bottom where I'll be posting links to purchase tonight's books, as well as donations to link, a donations link to support our ongoing virtual programming during the pandemic. A caveat for tonight's event, we're all at the mercy of our home internet connections. Please bear with us for any technical issues. I'll mention this evening at 8 p.m. there will also be a national event for Writers Against Trump with Paul Oster, Salman Rushdie, Rebecca Solnit, and Natasha Trethaway. I'll make sure to put the link in the chat tonight. We also are hosting Daryl Pinkney again on November 19th for Blackballed, and I will link to that event as well. Now let me introduce our moderator and we will get started. Siri Husvet is the author of a book of poetry, six essay collections, seven novels, including The Blazing World and Memories of the Future, and a work of nonfiction. Husvet has a PhD from Columbia University in English Literature and an appointment as a lecturer in psychiatry at Weill Cornell Medical College. The Blazing World was long listed for the Man Booker Prize, and it also won the Los Angeles Book Prize for Fiction. She has been awarded the International Gabaron Prize for Thought and Humanities, the Pre-European de la SA from the Foundation Charles Vaillant, and an Acad American Academy of Arts and Letters Award for Literature, and the Princess of Asturias Award in Spain. Her work has been translated into over 30 languages, and she lives here near us in Brooklyn, New York. Now I'll turn it over to Siri. Yes, thank you. So I am a founding member of uh, Writers Against Trump. And the three questions, what just happened? What is happening now? What should happen next? Were first posed by James Carroll, another founding member of WAT, to be asked today, November 5th, as a way to grapple with events unfolding quickly in time. The past, we do not know yet what happened in the election. The present, they are counting votes now. The future, by its very nature, the future is an unknown, a fiction we invent for ourselves. But this future question includes the word should, a word that harbors both hope and agency. We can and will act on an ethical imperative, a should. When I woke up this morning, I read an email from a friend of mine, a Renaissance scholar in Italy. How is it possible, she wrote, that so many American citizens identify themselves in an arrogant, violent, machiste, narcissistic man? What just happened was not a definitive repudiation of that brutal identification. The polls were wrong in the middle of a deadly pandemic and increasing economic devastation for countless citizens, especially black and brown people and women who cannot both work and mother their children at home. The election did not demonstrate that the potent emotions behind the fantasies and fictions of the Trump base have been dampened. Racism, xenophobia, and misogyny have been driving forces in the United States since the country's inception. We have never had an inclusive democratic republic, but we should and must strive for one. We have witnessed the power of hateful rhetoric, a rhetoric that does not allow the hated other the dignity of an answer. The rhetoric of repetitious lies, intimidation, and propaganda that makes dialogue impossible and has had and continues to have real violent and murderous consequences. Yes, words matter. Yes, hate fictions that serve the scapegoat mechanism matter. For those who think of fiction as the flimsy domain of artistic elites, it is time to think again. Cheap 
corrosive fictions are alive and well and spreading swiftly. The platitudes, cliches, and hypocrisy of media speech, including much so-called mainstream media, matter too. Media organizations have amplified every ugly word and tweet emitted from the psychopath at the top and made piles of money from it. As writers, we can articulate our opposition with counter speech, with stories, poems, and texts that break through the lowering miasma of the verbal climate. I have four distinguished writers with me today who do just that. Carolyn Forche, Daryl Pinkney, Patricia Spears Jones, and Todd Gitlin. Carolyn Forche, there she is, is a founding member of Writers Against Trump, a poet memoirist, professor at Georgetown University, and a longtime activist. She's the author of five books of poetry, most recently in the lateness of the world. Her book, what You Have Heard is True, a memoir of witness and resistance published in 2019, was a finalist for the National Book Award, the James Tate Black Prize and the Dayton Literary Peace Prize. It won the Juan E. Mendez Book Award for Human Rights in Latin America. Nelson Mandela praised her anthology against forgetting as quote, itself a blow against tyranny, against prejudice, against injustice. She also won the Wyndham Campbell Prize from Yale's Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library and was honored for her human rights work with the Adida and Ira Morris Hiroshima Foundation for Peace and Culture Award. In the Angel of History, there is a line that could serve as a mantra for many traumatic histories. Quote, they did not want you to know the past. They were hoping in this way you could escape it, end quote. Daryl Pinckney is the author of two novels, High Cotton and Black Deutschland. He has also published three works of nonfiction, Out There, Mavericks of Black Literature, Black Ball, The Black Vote and U.S. Democracy, and Busted in New York and Other Essays. He has been a regular contributor to the New York Review of Books and has written texts for several Robert Wilson productions, The Forest, Orlando, Time Rocker, The Old Woman, Letter to a Man, Garinja, Mary Said What She Said, and the forthcoming Dorian Gray. He is now working on a memoir, Come Back in September, A Literary Education on West 67th Street. In the beautiful piece on June 10th, <clears throat> excuse me, in the New York Review, the title, We Must Act Out Our Freedom, is followed by a sentence that addresses our subject. If a person cannot imagine a future, then we would call that person depressed. But if a country cannot envision a future, how do we describe its condition? That future is founded on facing the past. I have written about this. There is no future for this country without white atonement. Patricia Spears Jones is a poet, playwright, educator, and cultural activist. She is the author of five books of poetry, most recently, A Lucent Fire, New and Selected Poems. In 2017, she won the prestigious Jackson Poetry Prize from Poets and Writers and the Pushcart Prize. Two of her plays were commissioned and produced by Mabu Mines. Her work has been widely anthologized. She has been an NEA fellow, a Rauschenberg Foundation resident, a senior fellow at the Black Earth Institute, program coordinator for the Poetry Project, and director of planning and development at the New Museum of Contemporary Art. She created the Word Sunday series here in Brooklyn. She co-edited and contributed to the anthology Ordinary Women, an anthology of poetry by New York City women, and edited Think Poems for Aretha Franklin's Inauguration Day Hat. She was born and raised in Arkansas, but came to New York City in the mid 70s. I grew up as a poet in the swagger and shine of this volatile city, she wrote in an artist statement. In a poem called The Myth of, we return to the problem of time, of befores and afters. Eve, the poet writes, quote, is there to prop up this guy who claims he birthed her. She knows that is not the truth, but how to prove it? 
how to show Adam his story is not his own. Finally, Todd Gitlin is another founding member of Writers Against Trump, a professor of journalism sociology at Columbia University. He was the third president of SDS, Students for a Democratic Society, from 1963 to 64, one of the organizers of the first national demonstration against the Vietnam War in 1965, and the sit-in that same year at Chase Manhattan Bank in opposition to their loans to apartheid South Africa. His activism has never stopped. He has opposed unethical investments by prominent universities, including Harvard and the University of California. He served on the board of Greenpeace USA for three years, has published 18 books, including his excellent history, The 60s, Years of Hope, Days of Rage, as well as social and cultural analysis, poetry, and fiction. His most recent book is a novel, The Opposition, that will come out in 2021. Todd recently published an essay on voting at Literary Hub. He ends it with another insight about time as an ongoing dynamic of human reality. Quote, in truth, democracy is a verb. You keep doing it. You keep choosing life. So, Carolyn, take it away. <laughs> Thank you, Siri. Thank you for those lovely introductions. It's an honor to be with all of you. What just happened? What is happening now? What should happen next? The most immediate and narrowly construed answer to these questions would include that we have, despite the pandemic and concerted efforts at voter suppression, conducted a national US election peacefully and in compliance so far with our laws. We're told that results for the ongoing accounts may not be available until this weekend. So we're going to have to be patient. There is meanwhile considerable misinformation on social media regarding the electoral process. In the larger sense, this presidency and the election and events in the past few years have held a mirror to America. We must face who we are and not let go of, our, and sorry, and let go of our illusions regarding our commitments, our moral goodness, and our nobility of purpose as a nation. We are viewed principally as a military power in the world, and our society has also militarized itself. Almost half the electorate voted for Trump. This election should not have been close. His presidency has not been repudiated. It is my feeling that we, uh, that we should approach the coming days, weeks, and months with resolve but also with humility. If Mr. Biden is victorious and Trump leaves political life, our monster is not slain. We must face our history, the founding genocide, the legacy of slavery and racism, our indifference to the sufferings of others, our eagerness to prosecute wars of aggression, we imprison more of our citizens than any other country in the world. We impoverish the sick and fail to educate the young without casting them into economic servitude. After this presidency, everything must change. We cannot live as we did before. And we are in the midst of an environmental crisis, a health crisis, a crisis of racial injustice. And in the midst of all of this, we must also defend a precarious democracy and come to terms with our political failings. On our side, we are energized toward civic engagement unparalleled in my lifetime. On our side, people of color are at the forefront of defending our rights and principles. On our side are the young who have come of age in this moment with full recognition of what is at stake. We have all of them to thank for this electoral victory, if indeed we achieve it. Ejecting fascism, duplicity, corruption, and ineptitude from the White House is only the beginning. And if legitimately we fail to eject it, well, that is not the end. It is also only the beginning. Thank you. That was beautiful. 
Um, so let's just do the, yeah, we'll do the statements and then we'll, we'll, we'll open it up. Daryl? Oh, well, that was so beautiful. I, I just sort of want to sit for a moment. <laughs> I feel very consoled to hear the words of writers after listening to um, other kinds of language. Um, um, I have to say that um, I have no idea where we live. I don't know what America is anymore. Uh, I feel sort of at the end of my part in the conversation, especially um, as a black writer or uh, uh, one thing the pandemic and the election have demonstrated to me is that I'm not young anymore. Um, and what I can know now is very limited. So for me, the subject of America has overnight become a young person's subject um, because I feel that I would just go on repeating myself as worthy as the things I want to stand for are. Somehow there has to be a new light allowed into the room. Um, we may have avoided the worst this time. It doesn't mean that terrible things are not still to come. So I'm not relieved or relaxed. I'm still rather lost. And part of it for me goes to something I have a hard time explaining to myself, which is maybe why I didn't write it out, because I sort of couldn't. It used to be that immigrants were put through a kind of inculturism uh, enculturation. You know, they became American. Uh, and often it was, uh, uh, part of that was uh, absorbing uh, uh, this uh, native uh, racism. Uh, but they became American. Uh, and then this idea that uh, uh, to be American you had to be these certain things got rejected. Uh, but along with it, uh, a kind of consensus about what an American was went out too. And so we saw that as a good thing that opened up the field to a sort of identity politics or new identities, less valued identities, all those sorts of things. But they also sort of let in other identities, including white, uh, whiteness and, and defined as a way we hadn't had it since the 19th century. Since it wasn't the norm anymore, what was it? And in a way, we're looking at what it is. Uh, uh, we say white supremacy, but it's actually just whiteness in a way, or that kind of whiteness. Um, and I don't believe in white atonement, and I don't think any of the white people on this panel have anything to atone for. Uh, uh, so, uh, <clears throat> I feel that uh, the other identities that have joined us are on display in Florida in ways that are difficult to pay attention to. Uh, uh, when we say the Hispanic vote or the Latino vote, we're conjuring up a block that doesn't exist. Because we're used to speaking about the black vote, you know, this kind of block that was part of a, an important coalition in the elections of, say, Harold Washington, Carolyn um, uh, Brun, uh, the senator from Illinois, and finally Barack Obama, uh, uh, this coalition that Bayard Rustin and Ella Baker had envisioned of progressive elements in the society. And so the black vote was always a part of it with sort of the old union vote. But now in Florida, you have Venezuelans, Colombians, Nicaraguans to join the Cubans. Um, uh, and uh, these are not immigrant groups that want to be brown. Um, um, but it's a greater puzzle to me why in the Rio Grande, Hispanic people who were uh, months ago threatened with being thrown out of the country and are in sort of a deep uh, COVID-19 at-risk area yeah. should vote so heavily for Trump. And so for me, it has to do with um, 
uh, what we don't have, what we have too much of, which is money and politics, and what we don't have an, uh, of enough, which is voter education. When you think of the past and what voter education campaigns did in, say, 1966. Um, and so this American identity, I think, is gone. And the, and the globe has moved in our borders. Uh, and, and we now have sort of um, people who did not grow up believing what uh, the people on this panel grew up believing. And, and it's not too far-fetched for them to believe in every conspiracy um, because they come from places where they're all true. The question I still can't answer and that Marx couldn't either is why would people vote for the party of big business when they have nothing to gain from it except the fantasy? Uh, so I sort of find the country more of a mystery than I'm able to cope with. Interesting things are happening here. Patricia. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Hello. <laughs> I, well, there's two things, I, you know, I'm just listening to both of you guys and I'm writing down little things here. Militarization, um, uh, uh, can't re relate to, uh, I think, uh, and I've been thinking about this for a while, that uh, going back to the issue of American identity, that what we're also looking at are, I would, this is slightly different from what Daryl was saying, but we're looking at a range of mythologies yeah. that, um, that we are at this point some of the mythologies that we grew up with, some of which we have discarded, but some we still keep, are, are, are inculcated, inculcated in us. And so we have some you know, idea of what, who wrote the Declaration of Independence or how the uh, Constitution was uh, established or why Abraham Lincoln was a great president and the current one can't even hold a candle. So, uh, but there are a whole lot of people who don't have that. Uh, as um, and they uh, have no idea of what uh, any of the real principles uh, of this uh, country are. And then one of the things that nobody has really mentioned is um, is religion uh, and American spirituality. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I remember many years ago when I was getting my MFA and I had to read all these books uh, of Critical theory, and one uh, and one of them was uh, Houston Baker about the blues. And at some point, at the beginning, he talks about the whole idea of the theological in American society. And so, some of this is about the theological. Mm -hmm. We have just seen a man perform his own resurrection, right, in front of people. I had COVID, you know, and then I got shot up with steroids, and then he gets out there and says, "Look." I'm fine, I'm free, I'm, I'm, I will live for whatever, and, you know, vote for me. And so that's one of the things that happened. And, but it's also a way of negating the pain and suffering of all the people who were not resurrected, right? Uh, and so that's, which is horrifying because it, it's, it, it is, uh, it is a, a way in which uh, Americans use uh, religion uh, to, uh, uh, underscore their worst tendencies of selfishness, self-interest, uh, and greed, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, which is the other thing. But I, I was also looking at something that um, my friend Chavisa Woods uh, posted something uh, today and on, um, on Facebook, which is one of the most uh, cogent um, uh, explanations of why the very poor white people that she grew up with in, um, in rural Illinois voted for Trump. And this is what she said. I'm going to read it because she did it better than I can ever do it. Uh, in my hometown county, uh, the vote for Donald Trump uh, was 70% in 2016. This year was 73%. Why? Because the Democrats' message of basic managerial stability, of bringing the country back to the way it was before does not resonate with people in small town and rural America 
which is a massive portion of, portion of this country. We lost last time and is so close this time because large swaths of the country have been in economic crisis for decades, something that liberal Democrats in northern and coastal cities repeatedly fail to understand or even acknowledge. Going back to the way things were before 2016 for many people just means going back to being in poverty like they always were, to being desperate, to still feeling abandoned by their government, and like the leaders, do not even know that they exist. This is not a forward-thinking message here. And then she sort of takes the Democrats to task and says, but I still voted for Biden, and I really wanted mm -hmm. to do something about this. And we really have to start to think, I grew up in rural America, so I, I, do, I recognize everything that she just said. And this is also for Black people. Uh, and so one of the, going back to the religious and stuff, is that we have to look at the fact that, you know, everybody's saying, oh my God, all these people, the Latinos, these Black people, they're voting for Trump. And, you know, I'm like, we see the con man. We see um, somebody that's unworthy, that's incompetent, frankly. Uh, to take us through uh, 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 not only a medical and public health crisis, but an economic one as well. But they don't see it. They see somebody who gives them the fantasy. And so what needs to happen is that we need to start to think about coming up with better mythologies that speak a little more clearly to some of, to all of us in different kinds of ways about what this country could be. I don't know how that's gonna, you know, I mean, that's a big task. And I agree with Daryl, I think it really is for the young. And so one of the things I think is really happening, and this goes back to the Parkland students, yay, remember them? They organized that March on Washington. They, David Hogg uh, for the last year has been, been building the youth vote. So there are all these leaders who are like 18, 19, 20, 25, uh, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, you know, black people, white people, Asians, uh, Native American, all of them, I mean, queer, and they are not going to be quiet. They're not going to go away. This is not going to happen. So it's going to be these competing, um, these competing, you know, ideas about what this country should be like, it's, it's going to keep playing out. And no, there is no repudiation by a significant portion of this country. But there is the level of civic engagement for this election is extraordinary. I live in New York City. Nobody ever shows up to vote in New York City. That's not true. This year, they showed up to vote. So clearly, something has changed. And the last thing I will say is, we need to think about the fact that this may be the beginning of the true democratization of this nation. Because it started out as a place where only white men up with property were allowed to vote. A hundred or so years later, they sort of let women, white women, vote. And then about oh, 70 years later, they finally mm -hmm. let the black people vote. I mean, that's literally what's been going on. And so we are now in the 21st century and we're finally, the everybody, even with all this voter suppression crap, can vote in this country. So that is really interesting. And this is where, maybe this is the moment where, you know, America grows up and fights for what it needs to be. I, I have no idea. It's wonderful though, to, to hear. <laughs> it's, it's a good, it's a good note to bring Todd in. Thank you, Siri. Thank you all. I can't possibly reckon with the gratitude I feel for the writers and other Americans who have stepped up to the moment. What happened? I think what happened was that over the course of decades, a minority political party commandeered the apparatus of power and seized the government they purport to disbelieve in. This party was founded in a sinister coalition of plutocrats and 
evangelical theocrats pleading embattlement, who learned how to capitalize on the weaknesses of those they regarded as lesser beings. In the first instance, to bleed out a, form, a storm of disinformation. And then not least at all, to seize hold of the mechanisms of government from the level of state legislatures and the courts all the way up to the top to suppress the vote, which was the crowning achievement of the movements in which many of us came to life 50 plus years ago. Another way of putting what happened or answering the question what happened is that America unmuted itself. And what came out was a cacophony of muffled screams and screeches and longings. So when America unmuted itself four years ago, what did it or we say? In 2016, 45% of the Americans, voters, ingeniously distributed, decided to take a flyer on a racketeer star whom they mistook for a successful businessman, having concluded that his opponent was a terrorist witch from hell. And this week, having lived with their president for four years, 48% of a larger number of Americans have looked up apparently and approved what they saw. How did they do that? They suppressed democracy. The second reconstruction was as best the Republican Party could muster roll back. And that party remains in power and I can't underscore or italicize or bold faces strongly enough. This is a political party in power that has won the popular vote once, only once in the past 30 plus years. So that happened. And in the meantime, after the murders of more black people, seen in our screen, on our screens, we saw also an uprising for justice, the largest social movement in American history, actually. So we come up to our recent past, which is still unfolding. Unmuted, America didn't know whether to laugh or cry. So they, or we, if we are a we, decided to stall or punt or postpone. And now what's happening? We don't know. Disinformation happened, we know that. And we know that as of this moment, we are certain in our uncertainty. So I can only speak in probabilities. We have probably dodged a bullet. Many bullets. From where? From the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Climate, coronavirus, cash hatred, and predatory capitalism. So I have no compunction about feeling some relief along with anguish. What must hope happen next? The continued unfolding of the better angels of our nature. We must offer once again our sacred honor to find and make friends with those better angels and reckon with the worst demons. I hope that writers against Trump will evolve into writers for democracy and we will be needed in that unending struggle for the years to come. I think finally, it remains possible to say with Langston Hughes, America will be.
Yes, wonderful. Thank you, Todd. Thank uh, you. Yeah, thank you, Todd. And th and I think this is you know it's it's fascinating because I frame this around questions of time, and we have uh, maybe and for you to take up something that Patricia said about I I guess you could call it counter mythologies. Uh, people need. Uh, uh, we all use narratives, right? We all use uh, ideas through that are presented to us in narratives. And um, I don't know, do you have any ideas about um, how to think of- What is the most powerful mythology we can have other than the quest for freedom? Uh, this is what the United States of America was always supposed to represent, the city on the hill. Yeah. Um, I think that, uh, I, I, we know the history of the authors of the Constitution, but to me that doesn't impugn the Constitution as an instrument to guide us. Uh, you know, it has, maybe thanks to Madison, this expansive and inclusive something that can go with it. I agree. I, I, you know, it's the secular republic that I grew up believing in, um, and also, uh, 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 sort of liberalism, but these words, what do they mean now? I have no, I still believe that, I, I don't know, I'll stop there. No. Uh, also, I think, I, you know, the biggest problem we have at the, money, uh, at the moment in our politics is money, you know, and Citizens United, uh, yeah. decisions like that, that, you know, a corporation is an individual. I remember in Ferguson, the only black person on, this, on the Ferguson Town Council a woman said she could do it because her husband was for her doing it. The annual salary of 14000 made it so that only businessmen could afford to be on the Ferguson Town Council. And I think that's repeated in a lot of local and state governmental bodies across the country. So uh, money and political reform, I think, are very urgent matters. It is very interesting to me that the Democrats' small donors really gave all those super PACs and Republican donors, you know, a run this time yeah. uh, and level of donations. And, you know, it says a lot, uh, but uh, the influence of money and lobbyists on the uh, politics, I think is, is an immediate problem. Very little legislation is written in Washington, you know, the lobbyists bring it. So uh, to, I think that the uh, 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 democratic, uh, uh, outbreak uh, has been important because, um, yes, you know, it takes, it sort of diminishes or lessens the power of special interests uh, when there's this kind of collective wall in a way. I like the idea of the democratic outbreak and uh, <laughs> the fact that we're still hovering in some uncertainty about how far we broke out, uh, notwithstanding. To the contrary, we are in the middle of something with potential, with vitality, with extraordinary achievement against monstrosities of, that barely raise the consciousness of the imperfect Americans who started this whole operation. And I, I don't, I'm not a good time Charlie. I'm not a, uh, I've never in much of an optimist, uh, but I am. No one's accusing you. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I, I, do, I do believe in hope. That is to say, hope does not need conclusions. Hope does not need evidence. Hope does not need uh, a, a pat on the back, a collective pat on our collective back. Our hope is our life, and we're here. I mean, here we are. People, it could have been a whole hell of a lot worse. Oh my gosh! Oh yes. Oh well, yeah. And, but you know, and, it's, it's sorry. No, go ahead. It's built into the country a sort of anxiety about direct democracy, uh, uh, and the classic definitions of of democracy were never majority rule. It was always the protection of the minority against the state. Uh, now we're in this weird position where 
the majority uh, uh, seems to be, uh, isn't the howling mob anymore. Uh, the majority needs protection from this hijacking minority. You know, it's, uh, he's quite right, yeah. the party hijacked the Republican Party. So we have a strange reversal. And, you know, for black people, freedom, liberation is a religion. Uh, I could never tell the difference between a church service and the NAACP conventions my parents <laughs> were taking to. They were the same. Yeah. You know, every demonstration was a church service in some way. Um, but, um, uh, oh crap, I've lost what I was going to say. Sorry. Trisha, hmm. you were talking? You started to say something? Yeah. I, I so. probably lost my train of thought. But, but I, I, <laughs> Sorry. But, but I, you know, I, one of the things that is very, seems really powerful, one of the things I think that got lost this year, which is very sad, was, I mean, the pandemic was terrible, is, is terrible, and uh, the lockdown was very serious, but it also was a time to, that gave a lot of people a chance to start to do a rethink about what this society is, what it could do, uh, and then it got hyped, you know, you know, the idiot in the White House decided to um, throw all of the actual things that were worked to keep us safe and keep most Americans healthy out the window. So, but, but it gave, a, uh, I mean, I, I kept thinking about the fact that when I was, I was in Virginia at the time, and I kept thinking, all the birds are really loud, and I realized they were really loud because the humans weren't around. You know, that, 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 that literally there was some sense that we need to think about this country, this world, in a really different way. I wrote down something like, I want calm, but I do not want to return to normalcy. We don't need that. Well, we, well, can't, well, we can't do that. If, if you know, hopefully uh, Biden gets in, and uh, and uh, and maybe uh, if there's enough pressure and protest, uh, you know, the minority party will not be uh, as uh, horrible as it was to when uh, Obama was uh, as the yeah. your Senate's going to be Republican still. Uh, but the, the thing is, is that we need to start to really demand some other ways of being, uh, and not only in terms of the counter narratives, but starting to say, yes, free, what does freedom mean? And if freedom, if, you know, if freedom doesn't mean you get to stand in front of, of, of a whole bunch of people with a, a, you know, a couple with a gun, and a pistol and, and you know saying I'm fighting for my property when there's no problem uh, and, and, and claim that that's about freedom, uh, which a whole lot of, you know, that, that, that is a kind of narrative, right? That is a kind of yeah. story, you know, and we need to just stop that kind of crap and, and, and start to say, these people like the fools they are. And, and you know, I mean, I feel, I feel sorry that we don't have our own version of Bugs Bunny right now because, well, you know, he was pretty funny and, uh, and he sent up everybody. Uh, and so we are in a really kind of precarious, you know, I was thinking about, I, I think that the two words that I kept using this year were peril and precarious. Yeah. You know, we are in peril and everything is precarious. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uncertainty seems to be the name of the game here uncertainty uncertainty you guys want to take some questions we have also i think say go ahead <laughs> that we can't look at america ocean to ocean anymore that you know we the global context uh, mm -hmm. is more tightly around us than ever uh, yeah. beginning with climate problems uh, but also this reflection in the country of something going on elsewhere in the world these rejection of uh uh, Western ideas, liberal ideas, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And how did it happen that uh, 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 liberalism got so demonized yeah. or democracy got so demonized as, you know, people being told what to do by an elitist professional class? How did that happen? Mm -hmm. This populist resentment through the West is very yeah. dangerous. I, yeah, 
Nativist populism is not limited to the United States. It is mm -hmm. all over the place. You look even at uh, the similarities uh, among, you know, uh, Trump voters and Hindu nationalists. Yeah, and when did Hindu become a nationalist kind of idea? This is crazy. <laughs> exactly. Or Bolsonaro or Turkey or, you know. And yeah. rising fascism around the world. Yes. And, yeah. and in our own country. Yeah. I mean, I think we, we can't ignore the 25,000 organized self-appointed militias. No. You know, uh, and, and they are a threat. And they may still cause havoc in some of our communities in reaction to the outcome of this election. Yeah. Yeah. One of the embarrassments of this time for me was uh, pinpointed by the wonderful Irish journalist Fintan O'Toole. Mm. In a column in the Irish Times a few months ago, he wrote that he, like many Europeans and others, have felt for a long time acutely aware of America's sins and crimes and or weaning ambitions and so on. Mm. He said something new has crept into their thinking, his thinking, that America was now pitiful. Um. And I feel that I take this personally. Somehow I have enough of myself wrapped up in this beast America. No. Greeks and feel Rome. This, you know, this hurts. Yeah. This hurts. And uh, okay, well, maybe, you know, we needed to be taken down uh, a mark or two. But um, I think this has to be, this is why, by the way, people are paying so much attention to this election. The whole world is staring at this election, wondering what the hell, what the hell? And it matters everywhere. Yes. Yeah, it matters everywhere. I mean, I've been fielding emails from all over the world, or especially Europeans, but also South Americans saying, you know, what do you what do? The... Terrible. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yes, we're going to take questions. I'm supposed to be a little more organized. That's why we have Stephanie back. Hi, everyone. <laughs> okay, I'm going to conflate two questions together and ask, someone asked, how would you like to see writers get involved politically in the next saga of American life? And I'll conflate that with the next question, which is, what will Writers Against Trump do next? Maybe if Biden is president and maybe if Trump is still the president, what's next for writers politically and what's next for this, this group? Well, um, we have we have three of us here, but Carolyn, answer yes. When we began this Writers Against Trump, we didn't know what would happen. We began at a little Zoom meeting with eight people, and then we became eleven people, and it was it grew exponentially every day. And suddenly, writers were energized, and there were two thousand. And you know, we weren't really an organization. You know, we were a group of people. Uh, trying to catalyze the literary culture into actually becoming visible in the country in a different way. And one thing that I think is positive is that I don't think being political is any longer a pejorative term uh, it, when applied to writers and poets in particular, as it was in the past. And I think that's thanks to emerging literary communities and also the young. Um, and because it was never really considered a pejorative term outside our country. So there was something operating in our ideological formation that consigned writers to a kind of periphery of, of cultural visibility. And I don't think that's true anymore. And I think our organization is going to stay beyond this election. Um, we have a lot of work to do and I hope writers never feel again that they better be careful about uh, activism and engagement. I mean, it's tough to do when you're trying to get your work done, but we all have uh, a civic and moral responsibilities in this regard, and we can't escape them. You know, we, we have to be as engaged as, as anyone else is in, our, in the life of our country, particularly now. We're all in one way or another as writers involved in the truth 
business and the beauty business and the exploration business. And what we find is that the forces that are arrayed against democracy are the same forces who are arrayed against truth and beauty and the rest. And so I don't feel any longer, I mean, I've, this has been a lifetime struggle or contest within me, but I no longer feel divided. And I, I invite everyone who feels in some peculiar way reunified, regrouped by this ordeal to act on our better angels and to contribute to our, to explore for truth and beauty, which I believe finally, and here you can, you might be able to tell that I've been reading our great democratic poet, Walt Whitman. Mm -hmm. This is the American dream. He's the great democratic poet and he's still ours. Yes. Uh, this reminds me of what I, meant to say, which is one of the things the right wing doesn't like about liberal culture is its prestige. Yes. Uh, you know, the <laughs> ideas that move the world forward come from this side of creative and intellectual and political and social life sure. and that they can only react to it. So they always try to control it or have power over it. When I was a student, um, I was taught uh, that politics or ideology in your work was an impurity mm -hmm. or a literary flaw. And it was always a struggle for me as a black writer uh, how to uh, uh, address subjects without being explicit. Uh, the history of black literature in America is in a way the struggle for realism. And then it became a struggle to escape realism into the imagination but my education coincided with that pressure not to ruin your work the way Richard Wright did by having a commie speak at the end of your novel. <laughs> and now he can. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't, I didn't have that kind of a, a, a education as a poet, fortunately, because I was uh, part of the East Village St. Mark's uh, Church in New York school people and all of them were kind of crazy. Uh, but one of the things I've been doing since uh, actually uh, 2017 is organizing uh, at, uh, the American Poets Congress. And we were going to try to ha actually have one uh, this year before COVID-19 um, threw that out the door. Uh, but part of, part of it was to start to think about those issues around creating uh, what, what do we mean about language? What does it mean to be an American poet? Because part of, and this is like something that Todd was saying and also Daryl was that what we're also talking about is whose definition of American are we talking about? And, um, you know, so that the, the range of identities that people claim, you know, I still remember when Audre Lorde would get up and say, I'm a blah, 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 you know, like, took like 15,000 different identities. And basically she was just this large, you know, black queer poet. Uh, and it was like, yeah, we know, we know. Anyway, so, uh, you know, so, but the thing is, is that all of us, going back to your Mr. Whitman, we all do contain multitudes. And we all do, you know, have a variety of identities. And the, the thing that's really, really, really terrifying about the uh, whole, uh, the minority party, the, you know, 70 or 80 years of, of literally uh, from anti-communism to anti-gay people to anti-women who want to have an abortion, you know, anybody, uh, is this, all this anti is this, this idea that only certain kind of people can be Americans right. for real. And the rest of y'all, I don't know what y'all are. Extras. You know, you know, you know, extra. you know. So, 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 as a writer, you know, who's been doing, I mean, I've been in New York since 1974. As a writer, I've been writing politically on some level. But as I always say to everybody, I don't write political poems, I write poems with politics in it. And I think a lot of people write stories with politics in it. 
or ideologies in it. And the fight that Daryl was talking about was one that it was really um, horrifying because it was censorious. Yeah. And a whole lot of people, unlike Daryl, a lot of people fell under the weight of that and could not get past it. We have lost writers behind this kind of BS. And so we need to assert ourselves. I mean, one of the best things about Writers Against Trump, all of these, you know, the, the level of engagement is that it's actually made, because I still remember this from many years ago, I was talking to people and I was saying, and how many people are registered to vote? You know, it's in front of all these, all these, these artists and like two people besides me raise their hand, right? Now, yeah. That can't happen anymore. No. Okay. Yes, there's, the vigilance. There's a teenager in the chat from Spain who wants to know how this election is going to affect Generation Z um, and the issues that they're confronting. And I just don't want this to go by without uh, offering a little bit of a response. And my response is, this election is buying us time and space. It's buying us an ability to, to begin to do the work that we need to do. Mm -hmm. So yes, we're going to oppose much of what the Biden administration offers us because we're going to want it to be better than they will feel politically capable of offering us. But this is holding the door open. This is allowing us some, some space politically. It's not going to be solve our problems. You know, we don't expect the Biden administration to, you know, to suddenly you know, address the issues that really need to be addressed in serious ways. And so I want to say that to the teenager and to Gen Z, whom I respect this generation enormously. They're awake and they're pragmatic and they're engaged and they're involved and I'm impressed. Yeah, yeah, me too. Me too. The Black Lives Matter had antecedents. Not to, uh, the Women's March was very important psychologically after Trump won. Those kids over gun control showed that white kids could get in there. But Occupy Wall Street and the GM7 demonstrations were there as well, and all very aware of the mass movements of the 60s and before. So history is always with us, even if... Yeah. yeah. There's a tradition. Yeah. <laughs> you know, one of the mythologies about the civil rights movement in the 60s is that, well, America was just poised on the edge of its collective seat waiting for Martin Luther King to arrive and take that last step to the promised land. You know, the civil rights movement was unpopular for most of the 60s. Most Americans were perfectly willing, there's actually a poll on this in 1960. Most Americans, in the run-up to the Kennedy-Nixon election, thought we didn't need any more civil rights laws. We should enforce the ones we have. There were about 20% who thought we needed more civil rights laws, about 20% thought we needed fewer. The others thought, well, we have, we have what we need, we just need to enforce them. That was 40 years before the Civil Rights Act. That was five years before the Voting Rights Act. When Martin Luther King was killed, he was unpopular. Oh, yeah. So what happened this year, I'm not, again, I'm not good time Charlie, <laughs> but the outpouring of cross-racial yeah. expression about the atrocities committed by law enforcement on black people was unprecedented. That's not an exaggeration. It's unprecedented. But you know what? I think part of that was because, uh, going back to the idea of competing mythologies and figuring out what, who, and wh who is American and what does America mean, is that I think a whole lot of people saw that man's uh, nonchalant look as he was killing George Floyd. And I think they said, wait a fucking minute, am I like this guy? I can't, no, no. I mean, there was a lot of real 
at, I mean, I think there was a level of rebuke. I mean, I don't know how long it will be sustained, but there was this, I think a lot of people, did, a lot of white people did not, had not seen that just because it was so nonchalant. He just, that look on his face was just silly. And I'm, and everybody, everybody, everybody black I know, so we've seen that, you know, we've seen it. And so, yes, and, and part of it is that, but also there have been a series of uh, the, the militarization, going back to what Carol said, the militarization of the police yeah. that's been going on for the last, I mean, it started, you know, a, a earlier in this, in this millennium, has been has led to a, 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 a killings of black people, brown people, uh, queer people, uh, people who are not well. Uh, you know, it's, it's as if the it's as if we have trained across the United States all of these police departments who think that the citizens that they're supposedly protecting are uh, enemy combatants. And that's what we are. Black detective told me that uh, the best officers have some military training because they don't react right away. Ah. Biggest problem is, of course, these guys don't really have, and women don't have adequate training. Most cops never want the gun to come out. Uh, they don't want anything to happen because no one then wants to work with you. You have to leave the force. You can never make money again. You can't get overtime. But the worst thing is they know who the troublemakers are when they come to these precincts because they all have a history. Right. So they should, you know, there has to be police reform uh, mm -hmm. as well. One thing uh, I was sort of thinking about how grateful I am to Siri because, um, you know, I tend to sort of let others take care of democracy for me. <laughs> you know, I'll go to demonstrations and I'll vote, et cetera, <laughs> but I don't inconvenience myself. And when you think about the uh, court striking down the important parts of the Voting Rights Act in 2013. The same arguments used in 2013 were the ones the conservatives used against it in 1965. Mm -hmm. Roberts was Bork's clerk. Right. So these are inherited arguments on their side as well. So I think that uh, what the future asks of us or of me is a kind of vigilance that, you know, um, I sort of thought, well, I don't have to have it anymore once Obama was elected. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I sort of got distracted by not having to worry. And that was a false security. You know, they it's really so, so never strange. got over a black man being in charge of the money. It's so strange to me because I just thought the thing about Obama's presidency was that it was a kind of talk about a pause. I think it was a kind of pause for white people to allow themselves to say, oh, yes, we can do this. Uh, and, uh, and then we don't, have to, we don't have to think about anything anymore. And that was a, even worse. And, and so that was one thing. But I also think that um, going back to uh, the unmuting thing, I think the unmuting thing came, started with, with the Obama administration. I think the Tea Party was the unmuting. Yes, and I think that that, that and, and 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 because there was just this real, you know, between that and this these incredible, you know, the birth of thing, you know, all of this stuff is like, why is this even on television? Why are we listening to these people? What is going on? There is no filter. There is no filter. I mean, it's almost like I wish we only had those three, you know, channels like ABC, NBC. CBS, and then we have to deal with these other idiots. So, uh, you know. <laughs> you just have a few choices. Yeah. Um, I think we're going to, you know, this has been wonderful. Oh, I'm sorry. You no, know, it's fine. We ran just a little over, but um, as the organizer, I feel that we could do this like as a weekly show. <laughs> <laughs> I just get you guys, you know. I'm, it's so nice to see old friends and a, and a oh, hero or two. And let you guys uh, uh, please determine our future. I mean, this was this was wonderful, and Thank you. Thank uh, you. I give you all safe embraces. And Stephanie, uh, 
uh, from Thank the you, the community bookstore. Book Thank yeah. you, community yeah. book. It was, it was, uh, it was, I think it was just great. And um, maybe we needed it on this particular day at this hour. And I certainly I did. Think. Thank you. Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, Siri. This you has all. been wonderful. Thank you, Thank Siri. You. Thank, Thank you, you, community. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. There's another one at 8 o'clock. There's yeah. one at 8 o'clock. Thank you, Daryl. I will see you soon. I will. Okay. Hello, okay. everyone. Bye. Take care. Bye. -bye. Thank you. emotional. <laughs> I don't want to leave. <laughs> I know. I'm hanging out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Ending. Who's going to hang up first?